So this is today's programme. So uh, we'll just go through some housekeeping now. Uh, and then we've got two speakers today. So firstly, Eleanor Pearson uh, will be speaking about uh, on a topic of understanding the geomorphological impacts of natural flood management. And that's some of the PhD work that she's doing for her PhD. And then afterwards, uh, Steph Bond will be talking about water flow through upland vegetation types to assist hydrological mon modeling. And both Eleanor and Steph are from Water at Leeds. Um, and this, so this is a great chance for us to be partnering with them today. Um, and then we'll I'm Steph and I'm um, in my third year of my PhD at the University of Leeds. So I've got one year left um, starting after Christmas. Um, and I did my undergraduate at the University of Leicester, um, as well as a, a master's there with Anglian Water um, before moving up to the University of Leeds. Um, yeah, I think that says just about everything about me. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Shall I get started? Yep, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Um, yeah, well, thank you for having me um, today. Um, so I thought I'd start um, my presentation by giving just a quick overview of my um, PhD itself. So this is the title of my whole PhD. Um, it's very much looking at hydrological function in organomineral soils um, with respect to downstream flood risk. Um, so as we all know, because as flooding's increasing um, globally, um, and we've given a lot of our attention in the past 20, 30 years to our peatland soils um, in our upland, which are incredibly important um, stores of, of water hydrologically um, in terms of mitigating um, flood risk, but we haven't necessarily given um, as much attention to organomineral soils, which are our other primary soil um, in uplands in the UK. Um, now, organomineral soils are, um, have a mineral base um, with a peat surface layer which is less than 40 centimetres deep but contains greater than 20% um, organic material. Um, and they cover about 10% of England and Wales but up to 50% in Scotland and Ireland. They cover a much larger area than peat um, but really we don't understand how they operate hydrologically um, just from a lack of, of research and study on them. Um, so my PhD very much aims to look at these soils, um, but also to see what vegetation um, um, is present um, in locations that are underlain by organomineral soils and how we manage those environments to look at the overall catchment hydrological properties um, and therefore their impact on downstream flood risk. Um, so from this, I've kind of identified three uh, major questions. Um, as part of my PhD, which are, you know, do differently managed habitats have different soil or vegetation properties? Um, absolutely, yes, they do. Um, but to what extent? How are they different? Um, and then how does that contribute to NFM? Um, so in my talk today, um, I'm going to start off by having a look at surface roughness, which is really the first chapter of my PhD, um, um, for which we got a paper out um, in June earlier this year. Um, and then I'm going to move on to having a look at soil hydrological function, which is what I've been working on for the past six months. Um, so, like I said, the first um, part of my PhD was very much this focus on surface roughness, um, where once roughness is generated or runoff is generated in an environment, the surface roughness becomes kind of a primary control um, for flood mitigation. Um, so if we can, you know, understand how different vegetation types are, um, have different levels of roughness and different abilities to slow down the flow of water, um, we can then look to see how we can adapt those environments to better um, mitigate um, flood risk downstream. Um, now this um, was, uh, has been looked at in the past um, well, 50 years, it's got quite a long history, um, but we don't have a lot of field evidence um, for this. There's been a lot of lab-based studies um, and theoretical studies. We use a lot of um, Manning's N roughness um, in our hydrological modeling, um, but we don't really have the field data um, to provide um, evidence as to how accurate um, our roughness estimates are. So that was the aim of, of this um, part of my PhD. So to measure surface roughness, I um, created this portable flume made out of aluminium panels. 
Um, and I based this flume off work done by um, Anthony Parsons back in the 90s um, and by one of my supervisors, um, Joe Holden, back in 2008. Um, and the flume is very much designed to be something that you could take out into the uplands. It's portable, you can take it apart easily, um, and it takes about an hour to set up um, in the environment. So it uses this large um, water container um, and we pumped water into that from the local um, beck or pond, um, whatever water we had access to. And then you can pump um, the water through the aluminium panels to create a steady state overland flow. Um, and by that you can measure the overland flow velocity um, using rhodamine water tracing dye. That's a fluorescent dye that we injected at the top of the flume. Um, and then it's picked up by a fluorometer, which measures changes in fluorescence at the bottom of the flume, um, linked to a, a data logger. Um, so using that, we could test the timing between injection and peak um, rhodamine fluorescence, um, and therefore measure the overland flow velocity. And we did this um, for four separate habitats across three different um, flow rates. Um, so the work was carried out in Swindale, which is in the Lake District near Horswater Reservoir. Um, and we chose Swindale very much because it was a, a typical upland uh, farming environment underlain by organic mineral soils. Um, just for interest, you can see the distribution of organic mineral soils here in the, the UK map on the right. Um, um, now, we chose these, as I said, because they're, they're commonly occurring upland habitats in a farming environment, but also because they're adaptable when it comes to NFM. Um, I very much believe that if we're going to do research on, on surface roughness for NFM purposes, we need to also be able to um, implement uh, changes to our environment um, for the better if we find that um, we can make a positive change. So these are all environments that could potentially be adapted by the land managers um, to better improve um, the flood risk. Um, so this table just gives a bit of an overview about each of those environments. I'm not going to dwell on um, everything that's there, but the important part is that the, the hay meadows and the low density grazing um, as part of these were, were managed habitats where the hay meadows are cut and the low density grazing is subject to changes in stocking density. Um, and then the rushes and rank grasslands were very unmanaged habitats um, in this upland farm. Um, so we ran this campaign over um, the course of 2019, um, going five times to measure seasonal changes in surface roughness throughout the year. Um, so we started in April and then we did campaigns in May, July, September and November. Um, and I'm just showing you these photos because I want you to see how stark the difference in vegetation is. Um, between some of the environments um, measured um, and also the flume set up um, in different ways. Going through all the results for this, we very um, on overland flow. Um, if we have a look at the um, annual, um, uh, you know, the collated annual data for mean flow velocity um, for each flow rate and habitat, we found that the rank grassland was the most effective um, at reducing um, overland flow velocity and hay meadows was the least effective. So the, the least rough and rank grassland was the most rough environment. Um, on an annual scale, the rushes and the low density grazing were statistically equal um, to each other. Um, but I appreciate that um, mean annual velocity doesn't necessarily mean a lot when it's written down by this. Um, so I've applied to it a 100 meter continuous um, model. Um, so if we theoretically apply this continuous slope, um, you can see there's a really stark difference in the timing um, for overland flow velocity between the, the habitats and the flow rates. Um, so if we look on the left hand side here, um, the 1.2 litres a minute flow rate becomes a 1.8 millimetres an hour flow rate. That's like if it was to drizzle or steadily rain for two or three days and therefore cause a flood event. 
Um, but you can see that over 100 metres, there's a two and a quarter hour um, difference um, in the flow velocity to get down those slope between the rank grassland and the hay meadows environment. If we then transfer that to a large storm event, the 12 litres a minute becomes an 18 millimetres an hour storm event. That's like your Storm Desmond, Storm Chiara um, kind of level storm. And even then there's a 24 minute difference between the hay meadows and the rank grasslands. Um, and of course our flood peak time is the most crucial factor um, for downstream flood risk um, in our community. Um, so these results really show the potential of um, surface roughness um, to reduce um, downstream flood risk. Now we also looked at um, the roughness seasonally. Um, so these two graphs show the rent grasslands and rushes habitats, which were the unmanaged habitats in Swindale. And you can really clearly see this U-shaped um, curve of seasonality um, that's been produced here. And then we put this down to the, the growth um, and decay of the vegetation throughout the year. Whereas you can see that um, in, in July, when the, the vegetation is at its thickest and most rough, the velocity is at its lowest. Um, and this pattern is reflected in both the rank grasslands um, and the rushes habitat. If we compare that to our managed habitats, um, you can see that they're very strongly management driven. Um, so the low density grazing habitat here, we've got two management events. The red dotted line um, between July and September shows when ewes were separated from the lambs. So there's quite a, a distinct reduction in grazing intensity during this time. Um, and as a result, the surface roughness um, increases as the grass grows back um, and you get a subsequent decrease in the overland flow velocity. Um, the blue dotted line shows when the ewes were um, off-wintered, they don't graze um, Swindale in the winter months, um, but there's a much uh, less stark change in the flow velocity um, here because you have vegetation die back at the same time as the reduction in grazing pressure. The hay meadows um, again reacts very strongly to its management change, and here the red dotted line represents when the hay meadows were cut um, so they went from being about waist height to being almost at bare soil um, and you can see that there's a statistically significant um, increase in the overland flow velocity recorded. So um, just to summarise these results, um, there's a really strong annual cycle which is dependent on, on growth and decay um, but also on management that's applied to those habitats. Um, before I showed you the, the annual um, table which summarised um, rank grassland to be the most effective and hay meadows the least effective, but if we look at that seasonally actually different habitats have different strengths at different times of year. So in the winter months here, um, I took April and November to represent winter, um, actually the low density grazing had equal to or lower velocity um, than the rank grassland habitat. And we put this very much down to the vegetation that was present um, and the changes that that vegetation experiences throughout the year. Um, in summer months, the rank grassland and the rushes were the joint lowest habitats. Um, so it very much reflects on, on the vegetation um, and the need um, at different times of the year for, for different um, roughness attributes. Um, so I suppose that the takeaway message from these um, is very much that we need to account for seasonality when we plan natural flood management based on habitat roughness. Um, most of our upland habitats are a mosaic of different um, habitat types, different grasslands um, and different um, economic needs that come out of them. So um, we can work to, to balance those needs. Um, using things like field rotation to reduce our grazing pressure um, and we can also consider the time of year that we most need that NFM impact to come out of the management we choose um, but also maybe picking the parts of the catchment that are most at need to receive that so we can um, plan ahead with that with hydrological modelling and we need to think about uh, you know where does overland flow occur where is the water stored um, where is this most needed um, and of course we can match that up with 
multiple benefits for NFM, such as um, water quality or creating wetland environments. Um, so thinking about where overland flow occurs, that leads me on to the second part of my PhD, which I've been working on um, really for the past um, six months um, over lockdown. Um, and it really focuses on the soil hydrological function. So as I said at the beginning of this talk, um, we have very much looked at peatland environments in the past um, 20, 30 years. Um, and my, the aim of my PhD is very much to have a look at organomineral soils, which um, are often found in the same environments, um, but on uh, more of a working environment. So we find them on, on upland um, arable land. Um, so I wanted to have a look at you know, how much do the soil physical properties differ in the, the grassland habitats present um, and how do these habitats generate overland flow? Are they different from each other? Um, how do they react to storm events um, so we could see uh, where overland flow occurs and how we can best manage that? So to do this, um, I stayed in Swindale and used the similar environments to the surface roughness work. Um, we created two um, sites, one on an upper hill slope um, and one directly beneath it, so at different elevations, um, but looking at these um, an equal elevation comparison um, either side of a fence line. Um, so we compared um, in the upper site um, bracken on either side of the fence line um, to an excluded side um, down the right hand side here and a grazed side down the left hand side. So the excluded environment here is the same as the rank grasslands one in the previous um, chapters and then I split low density grazing between good grazing and rough grazing um, and these are the terms that the farmer use um, to describe the grazing quality. Um, it's very much the same environment um, but the field rotation is slightly less regular for the rough grazing um, literally making it a rougher environment. Um, so at each of these sites um, we put in soil moisture sensors at 5, 10 and 15 centimetres depth um, measuring the percentage soil moisture um, every 15 minutes um, and we also put an overland flow sensor um, on the top of the soil which measures the absence or presence of overland flow. Um, it doesn't measure the volume of flow just the timing for when overland flow is happening, either it is or it isn't. So if I move on to some um, preliminary results um, for this, um, we have um, here the soil properties and you can see very much that the habitats have very different um, soil physical properties um, to each other, um, which shows that management is really key in influencing um, the soil properties, um, particularly um, it's obvious either side of the fence line, the grazing makes a massive difference um, to what uh, features the soil has, which allow it to um, take in water and, and store water. Um, so if we have a look at this, this bottom graph in particular here, um, the KSAT is the permeability of the soil um, in metres per day. Now all of these soils are very free draining, um, that's quite high permeability, but you can see here that the, the bracken and the rank grasslands, which are our um, ungrazed um, sites, are, um, have a much higher permeability than our grazed sites um, down here. If I move on and have a look at the, the overland flow results from this, we found very much that, that saturation excess overland flow, um, exactly the same as peatland, is, is absolutely dominant. Um, and occurs up to 60% of the time in the organomineral soils um, we studied. Um, the overland flow occurred more on the excluded side of the fence than it did on the grazed side of the fence. Um, and this is very much um, a reflection of the duration of overland flow um, as opposed to the volume. So I know quite a few studies have come out saying that we think more overland flow occurs in the grazed side of things side of um, habitats. Um, our results show that, or we, we don't know whether, sorry, we don't have um, a conclusion to say whether more overland flow occurs, but we can certainly say that the duration of overland flow um, 
for during which overland flow is present was longer in the excluded environment than it was in the grazed environment. Um, now we think this is related to the surface roughness um, from the previous um, chapter that I was talking about, where the rank grass and habitat has the ability to hold back water for longer um, and therefore the duration of overland flow is longer um, in the excluded habitat there. So the final thing that I'm having a look at um, with this soil hydrological data is the reaction to, to storm events that occur. So here I've um, just plotted two separate storm events. The left one um, is a storm event in July um, and the right one is from December. Um, and you can see that there's quite um, a difference in the way that the soil moisture um, in particular reacts to um, the rainfall here. Um, now this may be a, easily a reflection of, of antecedent conditions. Um, certainly there was a drought in summer of 2019 um, up in the Lake District. Um, but you can see that the response of the soil moisture um, is fairly um, quick um, against the rain, it's almost immediate, whereas the overland flow is slightly delayed, which suggests the saturation excess overland flow um, response. Um, we can also see that um, so more habitats produce overland flow in the winter months than in the summer months, um, and some are more um, have a lower threshold um, at which overland flow occurs. Okay, so I'm still very much working on that data set, so stay tuned for hopefully a paper coming out in spring 2021. Um, but I just wanted to quickly talk about um, what my plans are next and how I'm going to input this field data into modelling. So it's become very clear from the, the, my previous research um, that vegetation types and the management um, are really key um, in terms of determining the overland flow potential um, and the storage and flow of water in environments. Um, so we really need to think about what are the most high risk periods um, for each catchment. Um, now in the UK that's um, mostly in winter when our ground is saturated um, or in summer when we have really intensive rainfall um, so much so that the ground can't take in enough moisture um, and therefore produces overland flow. Um, so I'm looking um, in the future to upscale my field results um, from the hill slope scale where we have quite significant differences in the habitats to a catchment scale um, and use the model to show seasonal changes um, in how effective that NFM is in terms of roughness but also to investigate the best placement of NFM um, within the environment. Now I'm going to do this using the spatially distributed top model, um, which has been further developed at Leeds in the past two years. Um, and I hope to kind of reverse the changes that have been made to um, the farming in this catchment um, in the past five years and see how the changes that they've made recently um, have impacted upon the natural flood management um, in the catchment. So thank you for listening um, to my talk today. Um, it's been really um, a privilege to, to speak to you all. Um, please do check out um, the paper that um, was published back in June on the surface roughness work. Um, and as, as I said, keep tuned for the um, paper hopefully coming out on hydrological function soon. Um, and if you need to contact, contact me, my email and my Twitter um, is just below. Thank you.